Hi, everyone. Uh, we are just a minute past and going to let folks kind of stream in as they come in. I'm going to go ahead and do the introductions to get that boring part out of the way. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Oscar Keys, the Multimedia Teaching and Learning Librarian at VCU Libraries, which is a fancy way of saying I help students and faculty looking to use creative technologies in their studies, teaching and research through our resources at the workshop. I want to thank all of you so much for joining us for our first ever Creative Inquiries with our inaugural speaker, Mimi Onoha. This series aims to add a little friction to these sleek ideas about innovative technologies by providing a platform to discuss the complexities of living in an increasingly technological world. Featuring the expertise of researchers who make and makers who research, these speakers do not approach technology as an answer, but rather as a question. How does technology reflect the issues, inequities, and injustices in our society, and what is there to be done about it? Before we dive into the main event, I want to take a moment and thank everyone who made today's event possible. I owe the biggest thanks to the PR and communications team, Sue Robinson, Kaslyn Applewhite, and Ryan Pander, who greenlit this project, secured funding, developed the promotional materials, and handled all the virtual venue planning. I also want to give a shout out to Greg Gregory Kimbrell, who's joining us today from Brown, who has since moved to another institution, but was integral to getting this project off the ground a few years ago. I want to thank my team over at the workshop for all the encouragement, especially my boss, Eric Johnson, who has been nothing but supportive of this project, even in its early pipe dream iterations. And I also want to thank my boss's boss, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Gaffery, who gave us the big thumbs up from the library administration side of things to make this event happen. The VCU Libraries Anti-Racism Work Group also deserves thanks for their encouragement to continue pursuing this series over the years. And of course, many thanks to our incredible arts librarian, Carla May Crookendale, who will be my co-facilitator co for the Q&A today, and has provided so much support for this series since we first talked about it back in the summer of 2020. And last, but certainly not least, I want to give a big thanks and the warmest of welcomes to our speaker, Mimi Onoha, today. Mimi is a Nigerian American artist and researcher whose work highlights the social relationships and power dynamics between data collection. Her multimedia practice uses print, code, installation, video, just to name a few, uh, to call ways, call attention to the ways in which those in the margins are differently abstracted, represented, and missed by socio-technical systems. She earned her Master of Professional Studies from NYU's Tisch Interactive Telecommunication telecommunications program and is currently a visiting arts professor at Tisch. To say I've been looking forward to this event uh, for a long time is an understatement. Nearly two years have passed since it's first, uh, we first conceptualized this series, but my hope of bringing Mimi to the VCU community goes all the, back, all the way back to 2017 when we serendipitously met at an elevator. I had been invited to visit the studios at the I-Beam Center of Art and Technology, where at the time she was an artist in residence. I was going up and she was coming down with her bike, if my memory serves me well. And inspired by the brief introductions and exchanges in this passing, later that evening, I would dive deeper into her work. I remember reading about her piece, The Library of Missing Data Sets, not yet a librarian myself, it was an interactive sculpture in which people could open a file cabinet with empty folders titled the names of missing data sets that either the public did not have access to or had not yet been collected. In discussion of this work, she wrote, that which we ignore reveals, reveals more than what we give our attention to. And this work had a profound effect on me. As someone who's been teaching digital art for years, I humbly realized that I had neglected to teach art that addressed the digital without being mediated through a computer. Since that encounter in IBEAM all those years, I have enthusiastically followed her career, incorporating her art into my curricula, as I think the power of her work lies in the ways that she makes power itself visible, legible, and thus teachable to students of all ages. Since her residency at IBEAM, she has, under, she has gone on to complete a number of other residencies, including Studio XX, Data and Society Research Institute, Columbia University, the Olin College of Engineering, the Royal College of Art, and most recently served as the inaugural artist in residence of the newly created Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab. Her exhibition and speaking credits include venues like La Gaete Lyrique, Fiber Festival, Mao Zhang Arts Foundation, Le Centre Pompidou, and Babel, Babel Lab Gallery. Her writing has appeared in courts, Ne Jean ne donne le trenet, 538 and K Verlag. 
In 2014, she was selected to be the inaugural class of Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellows. And in 2017, she was nominated as the Technically Brooklyn Artist of the Year. And now I will stop my rambling and gushing and pass things over to Mimi, who I know all of us are excited to learn from today. Um, and as a reminder, if you have questions, you'll have a chance to send them through the Q&A feature. You can send them at any time. We suggest that rather than the chat at the end. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And it's the floor is yours. Thank you so much. What a warm welcome. That was that was lovely, really, I have to say. I feel like often these introductions are so, they're just, they can be kind of awkward. And I'm like, what do, ooh, I don't know, it feels strange. That felt very warm. And also, what a testament to the fact that it takes a village to make anything happen. There's so many people who have been involved in making this event happen. It's taken so long. And I'm just so grateful to be here. So thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you for, thank you for being willing to be here. Let me go ahead and share my screen. We'll do that. Um, let's see. No, no. Ooh, okay. And are we good? Can y'all see it? Someone has to unmute and let me know. Yes. Great. Okay, great. <laughs> and that, that kind of leads to the other thing I was going to say, which is that I have this strange setup, you know, this remote Zoom life. I can't see the chat at all. So if anything goes wrong, or if I'm speaking too quickly, or I don't know, something happens, um, somebody please speak up. Let me know. All right. With that said, I want to make use of all the time that we have. So I'm just going to dive in. I'm going to start with this. This is a photo of my mom. I'm starting with her because it's a great photo. She looks amazing. And I'm, you know, I, I like to show her. I think it's good. If I'm going to start, start a uh, presentation, might as well bring my mom into it. But I'm also starting with this photo because this photo was the center of a piece that I made um, a, few, a few years ago. So like I said, this is a photo of my mom. It's from uh, the 90s. And this is a photo of all the people who look like my mom. So you might notice some similarities between their stances, uh, like their presentation, the color scheme behind all of them. And I will be clear with you, these are not people who I think look like my mom, but they are people who Google's algorithms think look like her. So these are all images that have been returned from Google's reverse image search. I don't know if any of you have used it, if you haven't, the way that it's usually used is that you can upload an image to it and then it uses a number of algorithms to scan the web and return other places where that image has been. So you can use it for a number of reasons. When I was working as a more of a data journalist, sometimes we would use it to upload and see if somebody had used a similar image that we were using in a story, uh, if, another, if another publication had already used that image. But if you upload images that haven't been online before, then instead of scanning the web for photos that are similar, uh, uh, sorry, instead of uploading, um, instead of mm, returning other places where that image has been, then uh, what will happen is that these algorithms will scan the web for photos that are similar to the ones you had uploaded. So what I did was I wrote a software script uh, and I regularly uploaded these photos from my own family's archives. So here's a sample of some of the photos. These are all photos that had never before been online. I say my own family's archive. I just mean photos in our house, you know, <laughs> photos, photos just sitting around. And I just wanted to see how we would be read by the largest search engine in the world. I wanted to see how we would be, uh, how, we would, how we would be seen, how we would be gathered um, and what would be returned, what would be seen as similar to these, these photos, these experiences that felt so, so unique to me. And this ended up becoming part of a moving image or video art project that's called Us Aggregated 3.0. So this is a shot from um, a project, this, this thing being projected, the video at an earlier solo exhibition that happened in the UK. I'm going to play a little bit of the video for you right now. Before I do that, I'll just explain a little bit what you're going to see. So this is a looping video. It goes on for about 15 minutes. It has some, some slight sound in the background, but I haven't enabled that here because actually the visual element is more important. Um, what you're gonna see are photos of my family on the left, and then a kind of scrolling, um, all like archive of returned photos from Google's reverse image search algorithms on the right. So there's, there's a lot happening. This is a deceptively straightforward piece, I think. I'm biased, I'm the one who made it, but I think there's a lot happening here. One of the things that's happening is that this is a kind of reverse engineering of some of Google's algorithms. I say that because all of us who are not there, we don't really know and we can't know how the algorithms of any particular tech company work. 
that's proprietary. Uh, the way that this worked at the time when I was doing this was uh, when you upload an image to this reverse image search, uh, these algorithms first, uh, there would be some image recognition algorithms run on it that would try to tag it by detecting what was happening. So, or what was in it. So this uh, image was tagged as animal. And then after it had been tagged, then there would be some actual pixel match matching that would return similar, similarly colored uh, images. And what I like about this is that it kind of shows the like intelligence of these algorithms, but also a little bit the rigidity, a little of the stupidity. And I say that because this image, the one from my family, is my me and my parents when I'm young sitting on a stone hippo. Hippo. It gets read as animal, even though of course it's it's not actually a real hippo that we're sitting on. Um, and then all of the images that get returned are of people with real animals because of that. So this is what I mean. It's like. There's an accuracy to it, but also a kind of rigidity. That, that's one thing. The other, one of the other things I really like about this piece is this lovely visual language of the grid. I think it's one that has its own poetry and it touches upon an idea of the masses. It, it's this grid format is one that any of us who have been online are intuitively familiar with because it speaks to making sense of a mass of things. You have a lot of data, you have a lot of images, you have a lot of people. And this is a way that you put it together. And that's, and that's, I feel like that's, that's quite aligned with the title of the piece, which is Us Aggregated. Um, this piece is about layerings of us and how we are grouped. And there's one level of us, which is my own family, overlaid against all of these people we will never meet, we'll never know. There's another layering that is all of us. You know, my family is a kind of stand-in for, for so many, really all of us. Uh, this is a process that happens to all of us all the time. And the way that this grouping which is out of our hands, appears as just completely normal, very natural. So that's that's a question that a lot of my work is about. In a tech-mediated world, what appears as natural? And I, I don't mean this natural in the sense of the natural world necessarily, but really more in the sense of what's like implicit, what is taken for granted, what's assumed. The things, and I say that because those are the things, um, these are like the assumptions that order our lives, those things we take for granted, those things that we, that seem just natural. And I also say that because those things that seem implicit, which seem like they can't be challenged, those are the things that have the potential to exert the most power, which means that they are also the things that can cause the most harm, the most pain. And in this piece, you know, I'll stop, for, I'll kind of take a minute and say this is, you know, sponsored by VCU Libraries. And I think this work, it's not about, you know, it's not about an archive or a traditional kind of uh, library, but I do think that it carries some of the same tensions that have to do with collections in general, which is this question of what gets included, what gets left out, but also who gets to make that decision and what are the ramifications of being able to make that decision. But this is different because in this piece, I'm not talking just about information that's being grouped. I'm talking about data that speaks to our experiences, our lives. And in this case, this company, just like so many others, has unbridled access to that information and the ability to dictate the terms upon which that information is presented. And so I think part of what is being naturalized here, what I'm trying to point to in this piece is a kind of relationship. There's a relationship between those of us who, who make these kinds of systems that a lot of us use, and then the rest of us who get caught up in them, and that's the majority of us. And there's a difference between those two groups, but many of us don't know those terms. And because we don't know those terms, that grouping, it makes that relationship, it kind of hides that relationship. It makes it just seem natural, not worth questioning. Okay, so this is, um, this is a good time for an introduction, I think. <laughs> I've already had one. Here's another one. Uh, as Keith said, my name is Rumi Anoha. I'm an artist. I work across a lot of different media. I make installations, films, prints, text. I don't know. I do all sorts of things. I'm very form agnostic. I'm today. I think I'm showing a lot of video and print uh, pieces, but that's that's just how it's happened to be. I also have a lot of installations and even um, I'm working on some performances. Because I don't have a set medium, what connects my work are the themes. So whether I'm writing an article for a publication or making a film or teaching a class or writing code to scrape a website or setting up an installation or in the last video, making a neon piece that's hooked up to its own image recognition algorithms, I'm always doing all of these things in exploration of the same kinds of questions. And uh, that, you know, one of those questions is the one I just told you about before, the one about what is just naturalized in technology. I often focus on emerging technology and I'm always thinking about 
these methods for turning the world into data and what's wrapped up in that process. And I, I think that having this focus allows me to be really broad and really specific at the same time. Broad because the tech sector touches everything, banking, criminal justice, education, entertainment, all just connecting with others. It's a gateway, it's a mediator, but also specific because I'm what I'm interested in is what's underlying that. Like, what are these base assumptions that are uh, base assumptions that are baked into the use and distribution of technologies? So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about four works, or I'm going to talk about three other works. I already kind of talked about one when I showed you us aggregated 3.0 at the beginning. Uh, and to frame all of that, I'll just say a couple things. One is that I'm an artist. I care a great deal about how our work looks, what it does, and its experience. But in a lot of these works I'm going to present to you, I'm trying to create pieces that are talking about a system or a structure and what's what's underlying that. These are all attempts to try and crack open what the mechanics of some kind of system are, what governs that, and eventually perhaps to consider what it looks like to kind of change that. But that's a very that's a challenging thing to do. How do you make sense of, in general, how do you make how do you make work about structures, systems, uh, things that feel abstract, and how do you do that when you are in the middle of them <laughs> at the same time? I think there's something to this which is like the antithesis of so what so many other creative spaces advise which is focus on one person one story one example and um go deep regardless though that's, that's what i'm trying to do and so i invite you to listen for that i uh today i'm going to talk about a series of artworks i've made over the past few years you'll see i've got the dates here i didn't make anything in 2020 surprise um but most of them i'm going to talk about work from 2019 and 20 2021 and i'm going to start or continue, I should say, uh, with this piece, which is called The Future is Here. This is another video piece. It was originally created for the Photographer's Gallery in London, most, most recently shown in Seoul, I believe, at a show I couldn't go to because of the pandemic. Um, and I think that this piece really, uh, I told you I'm, I'm thinking about systems, I'm thinking about what is naturalized in, in a lot of systems that we're a part of. Um, often the way that I come into understanding those things is through absence, what's missing from those. And I think that this piece really foregrounds that. The future is here. It's about the places where the labor for annotating and creating some of these data sets that large supervised learning machine learning systems depend on. But before I get into showing the piece, I just want to do a little bit of explanation. Please bear with me a little bit. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So this is a piece about machine learning, which is a branch of artificial intelligence. I have a very, very simple, um, simplified definition here for machine learning as a process, a process by which um, computers generate rules and predictions based on patterns and data. They create these recommendation, recommendations on their own and they learn and improve at them over time. So a quick example of this is something like recommendation systems, which uh, I'm sure a lot of us have encountered if you shop on Amazon and you ever get a little thing that says things that you may like and or says, oh, you bought this thing, you might like this. What's happening behind the scenes is that folks at Amazon are taking the data of what you have bought before, putting it in context with data about what lots of other people have bought, and then looking at the patterns in that uh, to create a model that can predict what else you might buy based on those things. So on your end, it looks like uh, you bought cereal and you just get a little um, something pops up asking if you also want to buy a bowl. But actually, that is the result of lots of calculations being done based on patterns in your data, but also aggregated data from lots of other people. That's very simplified. There are many more things we could say about machine learning, but I'm just going to leave it here for the sake of just simplicity and kind of getting us through. The important thing that I would love for all of you to consider is this part, which is that patterns in data. In order to be able to identify patterns in data, some of those patterns have to already be pointed out. Um, and this is specific for certain forms, certain branches of machine learning. The branch I'm focused on, supervised learning, and that is that you have to the data that you are giving to these uh, to these machines, to these to these programs, to these lines of code, that data has to already be labeled. It has to already be in a state where those patterns can be found. Here's an example of what I mean. This is an image from Samosource. And what this is, is kind of the class. This is like an image that you'll see all the time. This is a uh, it's an image that refers to the classic machine learning problem of image recognition. And so what's happening, it's which is or object recognition, looking at objects within within images. We should say image recognition, recognition to keep it uh, to be more precise. But you can see what's happening here is that this is this is an image. There are different things within it. 
there's a vehicle car and a cable car and a pedestrian. And the, the goal, what you what what um, we assume, what is wanted from this is that uh, you want to train um, machine learning um, models so that it can recognize all these different things. So that when you give it an image, it will be able to say, this is a car, this is a pedestrian, this is a cable car. But to get to that point, you have to you have to tell it what those things are. You have to reveal that. So this this is a really um, a very specific but really important task. And usually that work has to be done by a person. Somebody has to go in and say, this is what a, a car looks like. This is what a cable car looks like. This is what a tree looks like. This is what a pedestrian. Somebody has to label all of those things. And while there are companies, uh, I told you this image comes from Samosource, which is one of these companies whose job is to support other companies who have data and want to use machine learning algorithms. There are lots of companies that help leverage this. But at the end of the day, they still have to manage the fact that for supervised learning, this thing, somebody still has to be going in and doing this. And my, um, I, when I, I started to think about this, I was spending a lot of time uh, with folks talking about AI, talking about machine learning, talking about the effects on, on society, and uh, spending a lot of time with a lot of experts as well, thinking about what will these effects be? And I kept thinking, well, first I kept thinking, why is it that I don't hear very much, um, I hear a lot that's talked about the, the technological sophistication of this, but I just don't hear much about the people who have to do some of this work. And then that led me to another question, which was, okay, well, where does this kind of work happen? Where does this labeling, this annotating, this tagging work, where does this actually get done? And the answer is here, or places like this. This is a shop in Venezuela. Um, I know that this is a shop where this kind of work gets done uh, because I spent a lot of time on sites that are used to connect people who uh, will do this sort of crowdsourced tedious labor to the companies that actually need their help. And I went on this site and I, I went on these sites, I went in two different capacities. First, I went as somebody who was doing this kind of tagging because and annotating work. I wanted to see what it looked like, what form it took. And then I also went on the other side as somebody um, so I should have been giving that work. Instead of giving that work, I kind of hacked the system and instead said, hey, I'm an artist. This is what I'm interested in. Could you show me just where, where you do this work? So uh, what happened was that I got all of these images from people just of the places they do their work. One thing I will just flag is that you'll, I'm going to show you a couple of these images. There are no people in them. I did that really intentionally. I told you I'm kind of interested in thinking more about systems and structures. And I didn't want to be speaking for these folks who have spoken for themselves in many other ways. We can talk about it in the question and answer sen uh, section if you want to hear more about that. But there, are, but there, are, uh, so the images don't have any any people in them. So here's another here's another site. This is also Venezuela. The vast majority of the images that I received back, about eighty percent of them, were were from people based in Venezuela. I think that made a lot of sense because of the state that Venezuela was in when I did this collection process at the end of 2019 had just been through a pretty huge conflict and economic recession, but had a strong middle class and lots of people who had the technical infrastructure, all this kind of equipment and skills to do remote work and people who had the time and needed the money. And so in the course of, uh, kind of going back and forth and interacting with other folks who were doing this work, I began to have the sense that there are these two different stories of the state of large scale machine learning labor. On the one hand, there was that narrative that I was encountering everywhere about this being a very sophisticated technology of the future, this sort of gleaming, um, like, this is what we're trying to get to, this is, this is going to advance us. And then there was this reality, here's another spot, uh, which is that actually, in order for these data sets to exist, they follow this kind of familiar pattern, which is this labor, which is done at pretty cheap place, prices um, from places in the global south, so that the benefits can be reaped in other parts of the world, mostly the West, mostly parts of Asia. Um, this, what, and I, I began to become interested in it. Once again, we're coming to relationships. The way that this kind of story of what machine learning was, was obscuring this long existing relationship of how the work actually got done. So what I started to do, uh, I wanted to, to put these two stories right next to each other. Um, and this is, I tried to play with that. So for this piece, I took images, people, people sent me these images and I took them exactly as they were. And then I just did some, some pretty simple style, stylized little tracings on top of them where I added some language that played, spoke, uh, kind of played into this idea of the future of work and who's centered within that. And I was trying to use a little bit of a superhero theme, like who, who are the people saving the day? What, what is, or what is saving the day beyond just these, um, these lines of code, these algorithms, these models. 
who else like who else is involved in that so an image would go from what you see on the left to what you see on the right and also this is i should say this is pre-20 this was in 2019 so uh it, this we're documenting people working from home remotely but before this is a time before that was kind of the norm i would say so these are the spaces where um machine learning labor was being done and I, I was really interested in using this hand-drawn aesthetic that you see on the right. I really didn't want to touch the images people gave me. I wanted them to be exactly how they were, no matter what. Um, but I did like adding this illustrated aspect because this it kind of gets at the fact that there is a part of this work that is done by hand. And it bears the traces of the people who have done it, even if their labor isn't quite visible to it. And then I made a video um, which put all these things together. It's 23 minutes long. Uh, part of that is because it ran in the background of the photographer's gallery, which had like this coffee shop and huge window display so people could see it as they walked by. So when you have that kind of context, you need something that's not narrative, but that folks can kind of look at quickly and get an idea. Um, you'll see it flips between these modes. There are the photos people sent me, and then it'll switch to this other mode. There, it, the switching is very random. I actually programmed it so it's out of my hands. Uh, it's being randomly decided. I wanted to play with this idea of like, there is the machine part of this. There is some, there's a computational aspect of this and there are people involved. And I wanted to, to meet both of those things. And I suppose that with this, with this, pro, this piece, I was just very interested in why the people who do so much work to make this technology possible, are removed from the narratives of its success and from arguably from feeling the effects of it. And I was interested in what's what's responsible for that separation. Why is it that a supposedly new technology still relies upon retracing the same labor patterns that define colonialism and modernity in general? And why does that why does that appear just so natural? And of course, for me, I, I feel caught up in this very personally, not just because I went on the site on both sides, but also because I I I'm from I'm from Nigeria. My family's from Nigeria. I live in the West. I think about a lot about what it means to be in between these 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 different sites. So here again, this project is showing how these things are connected. It's a question about what's perceived as natural in a space that isn't solely about the technical, and it's as much about labor and history as it is about AI. And you can see. I mean, I guess you can you can see why it is that this question again feels very present for that other work. Okay, now I wanna move us in a different direction. This one is a bit, a bit more personal. And, you know, in the last piece, I'm talking about how a lot of different things are connected, even if, I guess in all of the, in the last two pieces, I've been talking about a lot of ideas that are connected, even if they are flattened and they're difficult to see. And I said that part of the reason, uh, part of what I'm interested in is what, what seems natural, what, becomes naturalized? What is it that just seems to be how things are? And then you start to peel apart and you realize, wait, there's something more happening here. I said also when I was talking about what was natural that I was not talking about just the natural world, but I'm not not talking about the natural world. I think the part about um, nature, the natural world is kind of important because there actually is a, a connection for me of how I got into thinking about all of this that does feel very tied to that. And um, that starts from, from someone else's work. From, in fact, it starts from British Caribbean um, photographer Ingrid Pollard. So in 1988, Ingrid Pollard, this British Caribbean uh, photographer, she did this lovely series of prints called Pastoral Interlude. These were images that took place in the countryside in the UK. These are produced before I was even born. Now they're held at the V&A collections in London. And what the whole series is, is it's photos of Black Brits in nature, but it's in a time when the countryside and the idyllic le uh, leisure that it represented wasn't really presumed to be available to those people. So what happens is that she, she stages all of these people in different parts of the countryside. And if you just look at the photo, it looks very peaceful. You can see somebody sitting on, on, on stone or walking, you know, along, along, I guess this one is a cemetery perhaps. And then there are folks fishing in some of the other photos. And they, you know, if you're just looking at the image, you could think that, oh, this seems, this seems very calm. There's not too much tension. And then you read the caption and it's clear that beneath the surface, there's a lot more going on. So I'll read the caption of one of uh, the image on the left, which says, it's as if the black experience is only lived within an urban environment. I thought I liked the Lake District where I wandered lonely as a black face in a sea of white. A visit to the countryside is always accompanied by a feeling of unease, dread. 
and then I'll, I'll read the caption now for the one on the right. This one's a little blurrier. These photos are, I said they're in the V&A collections. They're so hard to get good, good versions of though. So the one on the right that has this woman walking along this, this stone wall next to this grassy cemetery says, feeling I don't belong, walks through leafy glades with a baseball bat by my side. So in this series, Ingrid Pollard is talking about uh, Brits in the, in the 80s, Black British people, and she's talking about the ways in which space itself was not open to everyone. She's talking about this imaginary order which determines where people can move, where they can go, how they can be seen. And so when she, she stages these people in the countryside, she's doing this lovely act of revealing that logic by pushing against it. So the subjects who are within her images, they're not out of place, but they're out of their imagined place. And what she's trying to show is that this is an offense and it's just as dangerous. The first time I saw this collection, I felt this sense of recognition, but I felt it in relationship to technology and to data, not just in relationship um, to nature, to the country, to the countryside. And at the time that I was, was looking at the collection and making the work that I ended up making, which is in conversation with it, I was thinking about the ways that black suffering in general is typified and normalized so that it can become something expected, unsurprising. I was thinking about these countless reports detailing all the injustices that we face and the outpouring of, image, of images of physical violence enacted against black people and how seeing this over and over again begins to naturalize it. And it makes that data into a, a point in itself, not an opportunity for change. So, I wrote an essay about this for a book called Uncertain Archives, in which a lot of different people came together to write a chapter about some term related to data. And here is a quote from that chapter that I wrote. It says, the machine of contemporary American society insists that people have imagined places. And I have come to see that in the tech world, the preferred place for black people is within data. In data sets, we appear as the perfect subjects, silent, eternally wronged, frozen in a frame of injustice without the messiness of a face accent hint of refusal there's more it's not on the it's not on the slide but i'll go ahead and read it and it says it is easier to deal with data sets about black people than it is to deal dwell on the great gears of a system that penalizes darker skin tones or to consider the resentment that generations of state sanctioned neglect could breed it's easier to see black people as numbers and bodies than encounters people when structural workings of racism meet the distancing power of quantification both combined to freeze us in place. As I said, this comes from Uncertain Archives, chapter called Natural, and I've put the editors there, again, to this point that it takes a village to do, to do anything. That essay that I wrote was actually a kind of photo essay where the text was punctuated by these captioned images, which were made in the style of Ingrid Pollard's. Last year, I extrapolated those images into their own collection, and there are three of them, and I'll show you each of them now. Uh, this is the first one and i will say in reality these are huge prints they're about three by four feet uh, they look very small in this and the background is orange that is, is not actually the print itself that is because these are uh, photos taken from a recent my recent i had a recent solo show where these were shown and the, the back uh, the wall was orange and so this is this is a photo of that so these are photos that feature a woman in a server room um she sort of wanders around it and the captions I think kind of like Ingrid Pollard's, you know, you just look at it, it could, you could be easily um, just think it's somebody kind of be in, a, in some place. And then you look at the caption and you can see more of the tension that's there. The caption for this one says, places where our information matters more than we do. So server rooms are these places where data lives and it's where those who own it have direct, immediate, physical access to it. And I wanted to do a kind of reversal here to not be just in the data set, but to be positioned in the rooms where that data is gathered and is owned. And in this one in particular, this is my friend who's in the series, um, and the, the data center is one at NYU. I don't know how I was able to scam my way into it, um, but it's made for, for me in the moment of doing it, what made it all the more, um, all the more, uh, pre pre some, there was more, um, what's the word, like present, that this, these realities felt very present because her data in particular is in these, is almost certainly in this, um, this room. Here's the second one. It says, it was ours all along. 
and I, I said that this server room is, um, I said, actually, I think I said it in the present tense. I said it was, it is NYU's, but actually the story of these kind of rooms is another interesting one. In an earlier moment of computing, many organizations and companies would have their own server rooms where they would host their own data. Today, these are being shut down because it doesn't economically make any sense when you can just leverage the abilities of larger companies that are like Amazon that have these huge data farms and um, it just doesn't make sense for individual companies to run, do the work of running their own. So that adds another layer to this work. It's another layer of, um, of ownership being removed, of access, of kind of forsaking that. This shoot took place in one of these historic rooms in, NYC, in, in New York that was on the cusp of being shut down. Today, it doesn't exist. None of this is there. So there's no way anyone can get into it. And I think that reality meshed with the questions that the piece is asking and engaging with which is about who really does have ownership and who has power and who has control and can that be changed? And here's the final one. These are each shot on film. Um, this is the only one where she's kind of sitting. And this one was really, was really of all of them meant to be the most in conversation with that first shot, that Ingrid Pollard one, uh, the, the very first one I showed you that Ingrid Pollard did. The caption says, steward, not subject. Now I have just one more project that I wanna talk about. Before I talk about this last project, I'm gonna stop, take a bit of a breath. I told you near the beginning of this talk that I'm interested in what is naturalized, especially within uh, systems. I'm trying to find ways to talk about structures. Lately, one of the ways that I've been using for myself to conceive of and uh, conceptualize this is thinking of, um, is as, as a hair in the cable, that's what I keep saying. And where this came from is that I was working on some, some pieces that involved me cutting open cables. And I started to notice that in some of the cables I would cut, not all of them, but in some of them, I would see this, this extra string that was there. And it wasn't, it wasn't the wire, it wasn't part of that, it was, just the string that would be in it. And it, it was different depending on the kind. Um, this one, uh, the one that I was looking at was in headphone cables and it looks like this one, this rip cord here, do you see? There were other ones that are in fiber optic cables. These were made of different materials. Um, some are made of Kevlar, which is quite strong. Um, and they were, I did a bit more work, did a bit more thinking and research into this and real and learned that these, these strings have a purpose. They all have a, have a different kind of structural purpose. Um, some of them are serving reinforcement and strength. Uh, some of them are like wrapping around all the cables. This one also makes it easy for you to open the cable uh, if you need to. And what I became really interested in was that these strings, none of them were essential to the content of the information, but they played a role in making sure that everything was held together, that everything was supported, that everything could, the information within it could continue to be passed on. They provided the structure. They are not a thing that you are ever meant to see or receive. And I only saw it because I was, was cutting into something that isn't meant to be cut into. Um, but they are nonetheless extremely important to maintaining that thing that is within them, maintaining that information. For me, this became, this became a, just such a good analogy for, think about, for thinking about that question of, of the structure, the thing that isn't it's not the, the content, it's not the information, but it's the thing that shapes it. And then I started to wonder, well, what would it mean to change that string then? What would it mean to shift that thing that structures or those things that structure our understanding of technology and of what is assumed and of what is natural? And I think that in at least some of my work, that's a place, one place I find myself moving towards now which is beyond just identifying those things, which I think all of the other work I've shown you today has, has been much more about um, really examining, kind of looking for those things, that kind of traditional, James Baldwin has a quote about this as the role of the artist being to uh, really look and see past and, and understand the assumptions that, that sort of are knitted into everyday life. But I suppose I find myself now moving towards in some ways, not just examining those, but wondering what would it take to shift those. Thing is, I don't have any good answers about that. <laughs> so the work that follows that strain of thought or of impulse is much less direct, much less concrete, 
far more speculative and honestly much vibier in a way it's not a clear message it's much more of a feeling and i say that to introduce the last work i want to talk about which is called these networks in our skin this is another film unlike the other ones it's it's not um it's not just a kind of durational one that you're meant to walk uh come in and out of it's more narrative in a way <laughs> in a, but in a sort of oblique way still kind of turning that a little bit and whereas in every other piece as i said i've been pointing out something trying to say this is this is what's happening that's hard to say in this piece i i'm suggesting something different i think i'm trying to get at that trying to hint at what what might be needed to change things so it's a video piece it's about four women who work in secret you never see the faces of the women in the whole um, in the whole film. They're sort of the they're sort of the main characters, but they're also sort of not. <laughs> in a way, the cables are the main character of the piece, and because part of that is because what the women are doing is they are rewiring internet cables, and I'm imagining these as rewiring the internet cables that lie below the earth, below the ground, below the ocean. And these women they are putting new things into those cables and then wrapping a new kind of hair around those cables uh, or, or around the, the wires within those cables. And all of this with the idea that that's one step towards changing that which structures the information flowing through. So part of this comes from my own background as a Nigerian Igbo woman. We, some Igbo groups, Igbo people are famously decentralized. All of us think different things, but there are some groups who've had a cosmology that's stressed that when something in the land is broken, then you do these kind of rituals, sort of fix it to a certain deity to kind of fix it. And I started to combine his moment, the moment of now with a, um, a different moment. And I said, well, started to think about how internet cables lie beneath, as you may or may not know, lie beneath the ground and under the ocean floor. And so there's something that's in the land. And so if there's something in there that you wouldn't change, then the way that you would start doing something, the way that you would start going about that process is by doing these rituals. Uh, to begin to fix it. And so that's what that's what they do in this film, each of them with a different task, working collectively. And um, they do that together and then they create some some magic. So this is the point when I would show the film. I think I'm a little bit over time, so I might skip that unless um, unless we end up having extra time at the end. Uh, and I'll go ahead and skip towards this question. I've been showing you all, all along. I keep saying, what is naturalized? I think a good point to end at is saying, well, what should be naturalized? And that's a question I put to all of you, actually. I think it's a logical next step. And as someone who doesn't, I don't feel like I have the answers myself. And I think that any answer to this should be collective in nature. I think when it comes to our technology, our technology can only emerge out of the values and cultural norms of whoever is creating it and whoever feels that sense of agency over creating it. And so our task is to expand the edges of what we consider to be natural. That might mean picking up from other traditions, places that have been historically submerged. That might mean coming up with new models, new uh, new ways of doing things entirely. I don't know what it will mean, but I do think it's this is this is the ask, this is the task for all of us. So on that note, I will end things. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mimi. Um, so thought provoking. And I really appreciate this um, coming now, especially because the pandemic surfaced so many of these issues, our relationship to technology and also our relationship to the, a lot of the social systems that we live with. So I really appreciate um, having another reason to think more deeply about all that. And um, you're not just an artist, you're also a professor. And so uh, just to get us started, um, do you have any ideas about how we could teach technology in more thoughtful ways? And what's your approach to teaching your students? Mm, okay, so I, in full transparency, I am a sort of professor. I was a professor. I'm not currently a full-time professor, but I have been a professor for a while and taught, taught um, in university settings for, oh my gosh, I don't know, seven years or something, for, or, or eight, I don't know, for a while. Um, mm -hmm. So. When it comes to teaching this, this is this is a question I think about a lot and I still really struggle with because I feel like some of the questions, some of my um, thoughts towards te teaching technology are just thoughts towards teaching in general, which is that I think it's 
I think there, oh, I feel like there are so many, so many different charges that we have. One of them is to really hold everything, which is difficult. I say this because for me, I was, um, when I was taught about technology, I was really, really came up in that time of techno optimism where everything was like, you can do no wrong. This is incredible. This, you know, this can only be good. We're going to change the world. Everything's going to be amazing. And that now it's 2022. And I think it's become much more clear that that's, that's not the case. It's not, it's not like tech is divorced from everywhere else and you can do whatever you want here. That's, I think a lot of tech companies have taught us that. At the same time, what I was, what I find is that, um, though I'm not teaching in a university right now, I still do a lot of workshops through um, different organization. And what I have found is that the flip side of that is this clear criticality towards technology, which is deeply needed, but then can err on the side of paralysis, where it's like, actually, we can't, we can't do anything. We can't do anything about this because there are so many ways in which this thing is very powerful and we can harm folks. And I think that there's a need to hold everything, you know, to hold all of the potential to be able to put on um, a different kind of lens, to have kind of fluidity as you're switching through thinking about what's possible, to stay in the space of being very creative at times, but then also stay in the space of, okay, well, what does this mean now? And I think that that's, that is one of the, one of the difficulties, one of the big ones. That's one thing I would say. Honestly, Carla May, I could keep going, but. <laughs> That's well, like I mean, it's a good, good place to start. I guess embrace the complications. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Is what it sounds like. So um, let's see. I like, have a question come yeah. through in the chat. Sorry, Oscar. Uh, oh, that's what I was going to say is the Q&A was up. So. Okay. Um, there's a question that came through in a chat. Um, okay. So... It looks like, sorry, the person didn't exactly frame it like a question. So I'm trying to take it in and, and ask oh, it correctly. Oh, there's one in the q and As think well? That's a, oh, OK. Yeah, and I think that person's actually talking to the moderators. I think the Q&A one um, is from uh, Lillian Lewis over in Art Ed, just giving a little shout out. Um, and she asks, is big data ableist? Is big data ableist? Um, Lillian, can I, can I ask you, what do you mean when you say big data? Can I, can I do that? Keys in my yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm seeing if, uh, if she writes back. Lillian, I unmuted you if you just want to go ahead and respond. Yeah, I um, think that would be easier. Oh. I'm, not, I'm not fantastic at <laughs> typing. Um, under pressure like I can only type fast when I don't need to um so I guess I'm thinking particularly about um uh things like uh um google images uh and going back to that first piece that you show when you're showing us aggregated and um and I'm also thinking about work by a friend of mine, Unsu Kang. She does uh, work on machine learning, and um, and so she was using Google Deep Dreams um, software, and then available data sets. And she talked about the limitations of um, representation of race in data. So basically, the limitation of Google Deep Dream to create portraits of you know, like people based on aggregated data um, is largely structured by the fact that most data sets have a racial bias in terms of like what is available. But I'm also thinking about, um, I'm sorry, this is a little scattered. Uh, so uh, my colleague and I are, worked on this project um, thinking about uh, ways to disrupt urban space. So like, what would it mean to occupy space um, as disabled people and what are ways that uh, you know like there there's ada and a lot of federal law that um, operates on the sort of basis of lack but then the kind of larger questions of if i'm trying to navigate the world as a disabled person um there are not a lot of resources available because so much of like big data that comprehends space comprehends it from like a a walking viewpoint 
like just even the camera angle or how space is represented or what features are emphasized. And so I have this kind of, I have this sort of narrow slice of trying to think through space and, um, and kind of the ableist properties of space. But then I started to wonder, is that something that exists across large data sets in general? Are, you know, are there sort of ableist aspects that extend beyond space? And it seems like some of the work that you're doing um, may have touched on that. So I was just curious to see what your thoughts were. Mm. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the question. And thank you for, thank you for elaborating. I appreciate it. Ooh. So um, yeah, what you are, what you're speaking of, I think is to this, what I always think of as like the, the, the issue of the edge case, you know, the thing that isn't the norm, the thing that isn't at the center, uh, the thing that has been relegated to the margins, which I spent a lot of time, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking of. And I think that in a lot of large um, systems based on lots of data collection, this is a thing that comes up over and over again. Especially, I, I think you brought up facial recognition. This is, you know, it comes up there all the time. And usually in the context of thinking about race, where there will be these sort of technologies that are just poorly equipped to um, recognize the faces of just black people or darker skinned people because they don't have enough data, because that's not the thing that's ever been prioritized around collect collecting. And I think this feels very close to what you're talking about in terms of just ableism and just even how, th how the world is treated, how the world is viewed, seen, perceived. There are, I think, a lot of different answers to this. Usually, and this, this kind of connects also to what you were saying, Usually the, the quick answer is, okay, we don't have enough data, collect it. All right, we don't have enough of this viewpoint, so then let's get more of that viewpoint, let's bring that in. And that is an answer that can solve some problems. I have another, a whole other project that I didn't talk about today, um, which is about, it's called the Library of Missing Data Sets, and it really dwells a lot on this idea of the fact that not everything can be collected, or some things are actively sort of like pushed away from being collected and what, what that means, what that suggests. But I wanna go one step uh, beyond that, partly inspired by you, Lillian, because you, you were talking about representation not being enough. And there is a sort of infamous example of, I'm gonna go back to the facial recognition example. There's this sort of infamous example of this, um, I can't remember the name of the company, it's a, Chinese, uh, a company based in China. And they, were deal they had some kind of rec facial recognition um, system and it wasn't working well on black people. And then they, so so they were getting a lot of, um, they were getting a lot of claim. People were like, oh, this is, this is a racist system. What are you doing? And so what they ended up doing was using the uh, a driver's license database um, from, I want to say from South, no, no, where was it from? It was from some, I can't remember which country in Africa, but they used, um, they used a database of images from there, but they actually got those images without asking any of the people involved. And so the system ended up being able to recognize black people all of a sudden, but in the worst way, <laughs> it just did it without, still in a way that felt completely just very um, powerless, like removing agency from people and in a way that they didn't have any control over. So <laughs> this is all a lot to say to get back to your question of are these systems like are are these systems ableist? Are they racist? Are they are they all of these things? They can be. They can be because they are the outcome they they emerge from the outcome of the setting, the context, the beliefs, the values, the approaches of the people that are creating them and the moment that they're created in. I like to I hope, I like to think that in the same way, there are ways that you can unsettle that. And there are ways that you can use sometimes the same technology and actually flip it. And a lot of that has to do with who's, on whose terms is it being created and on whose terms is it is it for? That's what I like to think. I think there are also some cases where you, you really can't and you're like, you just shouldn't have this at all. But I do think that that isn't a, a hard and fast rule. I think that there's space in all of this. That was a long answer. I hope that was useful, Lilia. Mimi. Thank you so much. We're, we've gotten down to the last couple of minutes. So I'm hoping to squeeze in two more questions if we can be very short about it. I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, okay. Um, so one of our audience members has asked, did you ever experience any pushback or challenges from the tech sector while exploring these topics through arts? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. All the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I don't know. I short, short answer. Yeah, I, 
in fact, very recently gave a talk at a conference where I was saying these things. And it was funny because I was kind of saying them to people who were like, we know we set up the systems. Who are you telling? Yeah, we know. Um, yeah, let's definitely do get pushback. Folks understandably don't want to hear it. That's OK. That's my short answer. I guess it's never fun to hear about the flaws of whatever you're making. Nope. And um, OK, so last thing on our way out the door, um, have to ask as a librarian, how can libraries and librarians better support artists doing the kind of work that you're doing? Y'all do so much to support us already. I honestly feel like the minute you get into a library, the minute you get into an archive too, it's the full, it's like you librarians, y'all are guides, you help us. You tell, you take us everywhere we need to go. The hardest part is just getting people to go to the libraries, that's it. So I don't know if that's on y'all, I don't know. But I do think, I mean, what I'll say is I recommend that to everyone. I think that libraries are, it's not just about access to information. It's, you know, I, I took a class in grad school where the professor talked a lot about how one of the issues with some of the social spaces online is that there's no host. You know, there's no guide. There's nobody to kind of, who's responsible for the space and who can help you navigate it. Libraries are the opposite of that. There are these wonderful people who know so much and can help you make sense of so much. So highly, I'm a big fan, obviously. I think we can sneak one more. I think we can sneak one more in. Uh, I just think there's this really great question from Sam for closing it out on. There's a couple of questions baked into it, or not Sam, Katie. Um, but they ask, like, is there anything a regular person can do in their day to day life to address some of the topics you're talking about? Because sometimes it feels helpless. Right. What a good, that's such a good point. It does, it can feel very helpless, right? Where you're like, okay, well, but what do I do? I think that the answer is really complicated because it it's sort of like, well, what it depends what it is that you're addressing. There's one very like straightforward individualistic answer, which is like, I don't know, you know, start do what it's usually like use don't use Google, don't shop at Amazon, don't do that. And it like puts all the burden on you as one individual. And I don't really suggest that. I think I'm I think that I know I make a lot of work around technology, but ultimately it's not just about technology. And so I don't think all the answers have to be just through the tech space. I think sometimes I feel like the place where I learn a lot is through my neighborhood, my block association. We're all forced to be together. We have to solve problems. We don't have an answer, but we get to when we work collectively to like address the things we're facing, then that's that's when a lot happens. That doesn't show up in an artwork, but it's true. That's where I get a lot of my own inspiration from. So I think that searching out those places where you can be collectively working with other people and helping realize what those projects are. I, whatever it looks like for you. This stuff is all connected. Um, I know that's not a clear, like, just do this, but answer. But, at, you know, in this moment, it's the immediate thing that comes to mind. Carla May, I think you're muted, but I was also going to say, wow, thank you so much. Yeah. So you think I'd be a pro at this by now. Thank you so much, <laughs> Mimi. Um, I think, you know, obviously a lot of uh, feelings, a lot of thoughts, and uh, we're sorry that we didn't quite get to everyone's questions, but hopefully everyone heard a little bit of what they were curious about. And so um, we're right at time now. So I just want to say thanks again to you for joining us today. You're so privileged that you were able to share your work with us. Um, I think you. we'll all be anxious to see what you do next as you continue on in this journey. And um, thanks to Keys for bringing you to all of our attention and to sort of kicking off this whole thing. And, um, and thanks again to all of my library colleagues who were able to get this together and to the wonderful audience. I mean, we had such a great crowd of folks to show up to hear this today and just several people asked, but I just wanna let people know if you've registered for this event, we're going to make sure that the recording of this is captioned and we'll be sharing it in the next few days as well as posting it to the library's YouTube channel. So if you want to spend more time with this talk, you can do so after the fact. So thank you all. Am I forgetting anything, Keys? No, I think that's it. Just one more super big virtual round of applause for Mimi. Thank you so much for this Yay. event. It's been really, really special. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, for the invite. And thank you all for all your time. I really appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Have a great rest of your Thursday. <laughs>